All right, hello. Thanks for tuning in for uh, this week's episode of Bloomerang TV. Uh, my name is Steven, and I'm the VP of Marketing over here at Bloomerang. And uh, we're here uh, live today with Derek Feldman. He is the president over at Achieve. Hey, Derek, how you doing? Hey, Steven, how are you? Good, thanks for being here. You are the most rock star person we've ever had on Bloomerang TV, by the way. I just wanted you to know wow, that. Wow, so the bar is it a little low right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't say that. Um, I'm sure everyone uh, who is watching or listening to that, uh, to this, is, is aware of who you are. But just in case, would you let us know um, what you're up to, what kind of work you do over at Achieve uh, these days? Yeah, so I lead Achieve, and Achieve is a creative research and campaigns agency. So simply put, we develop and design campaigns, we research how those campaigns are successful with organizations, and then we really help an organization move from really small involvement of a constituent to deeper levels over time. Uh, probably one of the bigger things that you might have heard that we do is called the Millennial Impact Report. Uh, I'm the lead researcher on the Millennial Impact Report, which is right now a four-year study, and we're extending it over the next three years, but to understand how a millennial ages 22, 25-ish to 32 engages with causes. And uh, when we use that word engagement, we're looking at how they connect from social media to email, how they involve from volunteering to uh, leadership roles, how they give from micro giving to uh, major giving to as well. So that's a little bit about what we do. So why should fundraisers care about that age bracket? Why should millennials be important to nonprofits? I feel like millennials sometimes get a little bit of a, of a bad rap, but they've got some serious like donating power, isn't that right? That's true. So um, there's a couple major reasons that we look at. If, if, if you're an organization, though, that is completely cash-strapped and you, know, you need cash right now, this is probably not the demographic you need to go after in this, in this moment. But really, there, I look at millennial involvement with causes in one of three major reasons. The first one that we look at is that the millennial, because of a lot of their consumer spending power and how they involve themselves and buy products and services and goods, are marketed to very heavily. Mm -hmm. And the way that a uh, millennial is marketed to in the for-profit world also influences how they communicate with in the non-profit world. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that nonprofits are are going to probably have to change how they communicate with millennials because for-profits are doing that too as well. And why do we care about millennial marketing, uh, really, in general? Well, there's one major reason, is that a lot of the trends in general communication that happens with millennials are also being used with all generations. So whether, you know, for the first time, I think we're hearing in boardrooms, boomers, greatest generation, saying, hey, I may not know social media, but it's important and we probably need to be there. And that's because this millennial audience is really driving a lot of that. So we see consumer behavior really, really important in that piece. I think the second piece that's really important about why you engage a millennial is, is we look at that really big consumer spending amount. So they spend $300 billion every year on consumer discretionary goods. So iPhones, wow. yeah, all of this kind of stuff. In our field, we only we care more about what people are, are always talking about, which is the transfer of wealth, which I, I care less about. And the reason why is because when that money is pa passed down to millennials, the likelihood of it being really hands-free, really, really small. So because they're spending so much that there is, and we know that millennials, based on our research and others, have a cause interest in doing social good, transparency, and all of that, is that this is an opportunity that millennials can give to causes if they're communicated to effectively and they can sort of bring some of that money over there with them. And I think the third thing is that's really, really important is now we have a generation that is really a bunch of great digital marketers. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do a heck of a job, Stephen, what you guys are doing and, and other people. I mean, we now have this group of people who communicate, share, spend, do all of these kinds of things with peers, and they're going out and doing digital marketing on behalf of causes, and why not? Why not use that power and harness it and try and spread good words? Uh, so that's why we think millennials are important. Pretty important. Sounds yeah. Like. <laughs> so what is that shift that has to happen uh, in terms of communication? How do you communicate to them effectively? You say that, you know, for-profits, they've kind of figured this out and really put a lot of attention on it. What do nonprofits need to do or know uh, to really engage with this this group. 
So the good thing that, that we, we can do is learn from what we've seen in the, in the for-profit consumer world, because that's where a lot of this is occurring. So there's a couple things. First and foremost is we've studied over the course of the last four years really the rise in visual type messaging. So we've seen that with not only social network, but also even whether it's a direct mail piece or anything else. And why is there such a rise in visual components? Well, there's, the, there's this disconnect, I think, between what a millennial actually does and what they see and witness in person, right? So, so for us, if I'm to go out to Target, buy something, go to Best Buy, I can physically touch it, I can see it, I can participate in it, and I'm going to get this need, this good, whatever that is. But in a nonprofit, you don't necessarily get that, right? Somebody else benefits. So I help you, you receive the service, and so forth. So because they're so used to that in a consumer marketplace, we have to say, all right, how can we replicate that model and show the so what's actually being or happening to our beneficiaries? So we see the rise in visual platforms to help them experience the work of the cause so that they're much more so that it hits really into that passion piece. The second thing that's really important, and this is really tough, but we have to do it, which is we have to create feedback loops all mm -hmm. of the time. Do you ever follow any some some of the best social media platforms and companies always asking questions, posing different things to try and get responses? Millennials seek a feedback loop with communication. And it's just like if you see a millennial says, well, how, you know, they're working for you, and they say, well, how am I doing? And they've only been there for two hours. Well, that's a feedback mechanism that we're that they're seeking for. Mm -hmm. And so as us, it's well, if you give or if I volunteer, if I support. What are you going to tell me? How is that immediately? What are you going to tell me that you've actually used it for, or the asset's been used? So we have to create feedback loops much faster than we ever have. So this whole 12 year or 12 or one year, 12 month annual report, get rid of it. It's not I mean, we we really need to use much faster feedback mechanisms than before. And then the third one is, is we have to feed into the fact that they know how to message to their peers. We need to stop really creating this, what I would call a B2C relationship, right? So that business to consumer, that I, am, I as a nonprofit marketing professional for my organization should only be communicating independently with people without realizing, wow, I've got this millennial base that has a lot of peers, a lot of friends and everything. Why don't I really create a B2B relationship in that they then communicate to their friends? So what I'm going to do is because I know you're a digital marketer, you're a peer, you've got friends, I'm going to provide you with resources, I'm going to provide you with messages, I'm going to provide you with visuals, all of the things to allow you to communicate the message rather than me trying to do it for you. So it, that's some of the shift that needs to occur. It seems like that if a non-profit or profit were to make this shift, you know, be more authentic and engaging and be more visual, that, you know, it's going to help the millennial relationships for sure, but it's also going to help the relationships with all the donors, regardless of, regardless of age. Do you think that's a fair statement to make? Yeah. I mean, we, and as I mentioned earlier, this communication change that we're seeing is also influencing other generations. And it comes now into, I would say, we live in a world of what I call tangible transparency, right? So if I really want to know what the hotel is going to be like at the next conference I'm going to be speaking at, I can do that. There's, there's, there's websites that tell me transparently from, from authentic people what the real experience is. So that is something that this generation is driving constantly and that older generations are saying, oh, wow, you know, that's pretty interesting and I want that too. Yeah. I want to know not necessarily where the impact per se is, but I want to know, well, how do you do it, what's going to happen, how this matters to me and, and you as the cause together and tangibly tell me the difference life will be like if, if this happens, if I support or get involved. I'm going to ask you to get your crystal ball out for a right. minute. Um, so millennials are 22 to 30 or whatever it is. Um, what about that 13 to 21 year old age bracket? Should nonprofits be kind of thinking about those people? Um, I, I think the IU School of Philanthropy said that like 90% of that age group actually gives to charities. What, what are you seeing in the future for that that up-and-coming generation behind the Millennials? So um, Generation Z, technically right now, is what they're being called. Um, yeah, and, and what probably is going to happen is that, and even if we've seen this over the course of five years, is, is that no longer is it that there isn't technology that exists, right? So technology's always being developed, all of that. 
What we're seeing is, is that cohorts within the generation are being much more selective on the technologies they mm. participate in. And what's going to make the shift or challenge for causes is going to be, all right, where do we want to reach this certain demographic of this certain generation? How are we going to be on that place and so forth? So what I perceive happening is that we're going to have some niche audiences based upon technology preference going forward. And we're also probably going to see not just the rise of more visual type content that we're seeing this generation be a part of, but also much more leveraged peer stuff than ever before. I mean, right now we're doing a lot of just peer fundraising and influence in small groups. We'll still see that, but it's going to be much more guarded and safeguarded. So the network by the Generation Z is not necessarily going to be, well, I'm on Facebook, so now everybody's just going to be there. It's I'm in this environment, maybe in a larger network of people, but it's pretty close. I'm not going to allow you in cause unless I really, really care about you. So therefore, you're going to have to work extra hard to try and connect with me. So I think we're going to see a little bit more closed networks with this next generation. And we're starting to see that with things like Snapchat and some other technologies right. that, that exist. So we're about out of time, but I want to give you a chance to uh, to talk about MCON. You've got this awesome event coming up that's it, man, it's become a juggernaut, I feel like, <laughs> in the nonprofit sector and really beyond. I mean, you've got some incredible speakers lined up. Tell, tell folks a little bit about uh, MCON coming up here in a couple months. So we, um, it's, it's a great event. So uh, we've had it. This is the fourth year for the event. And like some other things we've done here, we kind of did it backwards. <laughs> so we started out as a virtual conference um, and then decided, well, we're bringing people together. How come we're not doing it in person? So then it sort of brought into the in-person, where most people probably start a conference and then say, how do we go online with it? So definitely backwards. But what MCON is is a two-day event where we talk about different ways for what I would say companies and causes to learn about the next generation of activist, consumer, and do-gooder, all, all in there. Um, we cover things like culture, relationships, resources, and movements. We've got fantastic speakers from a NASCAR driver to um, individuals from Forbes, PBS, Working Hard, to the Starter League and others, including Rosario Dawson headlining, Dale Partridge wow. with Sevenly, Gene Case with the Case Foundation will be speaking, uh, Justin Howard with Sprout Social, the CEO, talking about some of the social media components that are occurring, too. So a fantastic two-day event. Um, there will be some really fun things if you can attend in person, including a social for good event with Chobani and the Case Foundation, the Chronicle Philanthropy event, too, as well. Uh, online, anybody can join for free and watch it. Um, and we'll also be maybe debuting some research pieces there. So Ooh. I'm going to save that for a little bit later. Oh, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love that if a fundraiser goes to this event, they're going to get exposed to a lot of different sort of you know, philosophies and industries that maybe they hadn't thought of before but that could really help them. So that's one thing I really like about the speakers you've got lined up. It's not just kind of the usual, you know, nonprofit, you know, speakers, but it's going to be, you know, across the board, which is really great. Yeah. We really try, um, we curate all the speakers ourselves and with a committee of other people. And our goal is, honestly, if, they've, if they have um, heard, been heard somewhere else, we try not to have them <laughs> unless they're new or relevant, interesting yeah. content uh, that will be there. And with our focus, it's, it's interesting. Somebody said last year, you know, one minute I'm just hanging out, and the next minute there's the head of Twitter and Social for Good, and, you know, Sophia Bush is hanging out over there. So it's a great event for people to come together from very different aspects and backgrounds to, to learn what's happening in next generation work. So it's Love fun. It. We'll link to all that uh, in the blog post for this. And you're uh, an insider, uh, too, as I'm well. an insider, yeah. I'm going to be there. So if you're there, look for me. Look for Derek. Say hi to us. you got to buy a ticket now because they're going to yes. sell out. So check yeah, that out. Only 300 tickets in person. We limit the amount of people in, in person. Okay. If you don't make it in person, if the tickets do sell out, no worries. You can watch online at home, tablet, device, mobile, whatever you want to do. Cool. We'll link to all that stuff. Derek, this is awesome having you. Thank you for uh, hanging out with us for a little while. Well, it's a pleasure. Thanks so much, and I'm uh, looking forward to the next time. All right, everyone. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We will catch you next week. So we'll talk to you then.